I'm going to read from a <laughs> paper because I give canned speeches. Just kidding. Um, Hamataki api, not api. My name is um, Nick Estes. Um, I greet each and one of you um, with a handshake. And as is cu customary when visiting the homelands of other indigenous nations, I want to recognize the Massachusetts peoples, um, the original caretakers of these lands, waters, and non-human relations in this place. But I, I just want to make a comment um, about kind of an, a, a general sort of observation of New England, um, having lived here for almost a year now, um, is that this is where you know contact and coloni uh, settler colonialism began. But I find it really fascinating that it's in incredibly buried and erased, um, and that there are no like American Indian studies programs here, um, and that's a huge fault. So some of the things um, that I'm talking about in here, um, in this particular presentation, are taking up themes that are um, dominant in the fields of American Indian studies and Indigenous studies. And I will say categorically that the universities in this particular area are half a century, if not a century, behind of where the rest of the, the, the field is going. So I apologize, um, but I also don't apologize um, if, if there's some things that I'm talking about here that you don't understand. <laughs> Blame your university. Because it, it's, it's a rich university, but it's not investing money in the right place. Um, so <clears throat> my talk today draws uh, from my forthcoming book, uh, my work makes interventions into three fields, history, environmental studies, and indigenous governance. The main focus of, of uh, today's talk, however, um, is more about my, my forthcoming book titled Our History is the Future, Winnie Wichoni and the Struggle for Native Liberation, which develops an alternative political and intellectual history from the 19th century to the present of the Ocheti Shakoi, the Lakota, um, Dakota, I don't know, I'll just use that. Uh, and Nakota-speaking people of the Seven Council Fires. In particular, I place into historical context the recent struggle spearheaded by the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe to stop the, dis the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline, or DAPL, from trespassing through unceded treaty territory, through culturally sensitive sites and across Minnesota, the Missouri River, threatening a fresh water source for millions of humans and countless non-humans. Well, I do not give a play-by-play -play of the camps themselves. Um, I do that in, an, um, with a, in another book where it's a collected, a collected um, volume on sort of the activists and scholars reflecting on No Dapple and Mini Wichoni. I do place the present movement marching under the banner of uh, Mini Wichoni or Water's Life into a his longer history of how the relationships um, to water, land, and non-human relations, such as Buffalo, changed over time. And while there is much to be said about indigenous sovereignty and the movement dubbed with the hashtag no dapple, and believe me, I do have a lot to say about sovereignty, um, I turn to what indigenous feminists and activists have called a radical relationality. Sovereignty, a concept that traces its lineage from the Westphalian or European state system, can be seen as a defensive tool used by indigenous nations to negotiate relations between those seen as different, such as the occupying power called the United States. On the other hand, a radical relationality or the language of kinship, in some cases, makes what is unfamiliar into familiar in order to relate. This includes other indigenous and non-indigenous peoples and other than humans. After all, it, is, it, it was no coincidence the Ocheti Shakoni spearheaded a movement that brought together more than 300 indigenous nations um, from this hemisphere and numerous allied movements under a single flag to protect our relative Mini Minisose, Mini Wichoni, in other words, the water. But before we begin that discussion, I want to tell you a story to set the stage um, and just to kind of give you uh, a sort of visual representation of the place that I'm talking about. This is kind of a bad map because it doesn't really say what, um, where the reservations are, but this is um, the sort of treaty boundaries and how they've been redefined over the years and then moving into sort of the reservation period and then um, the, uh, the, uh, the construction of or the, the, the current path to the Dakota Access Pipeline. So in the aftermath of the October 27th, 2016 police raid on the 1851 treaty camps, the smell of urine wafted over um, the camps. 
During the treaty camp raid, hundreds had been arrested uh, and, and marked in black and a black marker on the forearm with an intake number, loaded onto buses and crowded into makeshift cells pieced together from dog kennels. Some remain behind bars today, such as Red Fawn Palace and Little Feather, facing years in prison. Police and private security heaped the camp's confiscated remnants near the entrance of Ocheti Shakoi camp. Ceremonial items such as eagle feathers, pipes, medicine bundles, and staffs, and cut-up tents, sleeping bags, clothing, and teepees, in other words, people's lives. A stomach-turning stench emanated from the pile. Cops and private pipeline security had pissed on the items before returning them. And one night, after it was decided to ceremonially burn the urine-soaked items, and a Hunktawan elder gathered young water protectors around a fire, including me. She was dressed in the regalia she wore the day the police raided the treaty camp. Dozens of copper pennies um, hung by ribbon, red ribbons from her dark blue trade cloth dress. She told the story of our ancestors who were killed during the 1862 U.S. Dakota War, including my ancestor, or my ancestors, I should say. Evicted from their homelands, they fled to present-day Standing Rock, crossing the Missouri River not too far from the location of the Ocheti Shakoi camp after U.S. cavalrymen surrounded and massacred Dakotas and Lakotas in a buffalo hunt camp at Whitestone Hill on September 3, 1863, 150 years earlier to the day that DAPL private security sicked attack dogs on unarmed water protectors at a pipeline construction site. That day, in defiance of uh, tribal historic preservation officers from Standing Rock and elsewhere, DAPL ordered caterpillar earth movers to bulldoze a marked Dakota burial ground to lay pipe. The day after Christmas in 1862, soldiers gathered up 38 Dakota uh, men and boys imprisoned at Fort Snelling in Man uh, Mankato, um, Minnesota. The medicine bundles were confiscated, heaped in a large pile, and burned as they sang their death songs and were led to the gallows to be hanged for a crime of defending their nation and homelands. That, that same week, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing black slaves during the Civil War. He signed the death sentences of 38 Dakota patriots in what is today the largest mass execution in U.S. history. In the cover of darkness, doctors from the Mayo Clinic stole the Dakota men's bodies and used them to be used in autopsies and medical experiments. The coppers, copper pennies hanging from the elders' regalia had holes drilled into Lincoln's ears with red ribbons threaded through. He didn't listen, she said of the great emancipator, so we opened his ears. After the 1876 Battle of Greasy Grass, Lakota women used awls to gouge holes in Custer's ears so he would hear better in the afterlife. This time it was President Barack Obama, North Dakota Governor Jack Dalrymple, and Morton County Sheriff uh, Kyle Kirchmeyer who refused to listen. As the singers began a prayer song, the elder reminded the younger ones that tears flowing from their eyes were the ancestors speaking through them, and they were not the tears of trauma, but of te uh, tears of liberation. We have survived genocide after genocide, she reminded them. Then she danced, and the penny swayed with the flicks of fire and smoke billowing upwards, and behind her stood armed police half a mile away on a hill in front of bright floodlights blowing down on the camp. History was hardly passed. So the Ocheti Shakoi um, call Dapple Zuzecha Sapa, the black snake, which came from a prophecy that a monstrous black snake would extend itself across the land, threatening all life and bringing difficult times that would ultimately unite indigenous and non-indigenous nations in a historic life and death struggle for Unchi Makar, Grandmother Earth, um, so that she could live. Prophets and prophecies do not predict the future and are not mystical or ahistorical occurrences. Rather, we see prophecy, as in the case of the black snake, as revolutionary theory. It is not a divination of the future, but a grounded historical materialist analysis of the times in which we live, of the times in which we lived, and of what could be. How did we survive? How and why are we surviving? And what is the possible future on this land? What the Ohangtua uh, elder reminded us with her story of survival and resistance is that we, the seventh generation, are the ancestors from the before and before and the already forthcoming. What happened at Standing Rock was part of a longer resistance movement 
for the liberation of the Ocheti Shakoe, Minisose, and what we would call Mitawa Makoche, or our homelands, and also the emancipation of the earth from capital. For two centuries, settlers have attempted to construct various forms of infrastructure across Minisose, the Missouri River, whether it's for the penetration of the fur trade or steamboat travel, massive earthen rolled dam hydroelectric dams or oil pipelines. In opposition to the infrastructures of settler colonialism, which are more than physical things, such as pipelines, but also include forms of white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, and imperialism, I trace the formation of distinct political identities, their own forms of infrastructural knowledge that are simultaneously anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, non-hierarchical, and um, what I call traditions of indigenous resistance specifically traditions of Ocheti Shakoni resistance, a radical theory, a radical intellectual theory of history. This brings about another relationship that I deal with, a relationship to a radical indigenous past that trespasses into the present and provides a pathway to a more just and sustainable future. What I refer to as traditions of indigenous resistance differs from um, how we understand tradition as a static, unchanging practice a view of that aligns itself with the idea of authentic, essentialist, or apolitical notions of indigenous identity. This conservative view often works in favor of the trope of the vanishing Indian and reckons with history as, and the present as some wish, wish it to be and not as it is. Traditions of indigenous resistance can be best be described as what Raymond Williams calls a selective tradition. A selective tradition chooses prior experiences of one's ancestors as forebearers and sometimes active participants, hence the American Indian Movement's popular phrase in the spirit of crazy horse, to inform current resistance movements while sustaining them as part of a living tradition under constant formation. In this sense, traditions of indigenous resistance are not entirely new, nor are they necessarily a check checklist of people or concepts. Traditions of indigenous resistance are an accumulation, a steady accretion of ways of knowing, experiencing, and practicing relationality to humans and non-humans, um, a radical consciousness deeply embedded in history and place that expresses the ultimate desire for freedom and liberation. To know and trust one's history is not to be defeated by it. From these traditions arise indigenous radicals and indigenous radicalism. To be a radical means to get at the root of something to get at the root of settler colonialism and how to get re free from it, we must turn to those who have resisted it the longest. So I place um, <clears throat> no dapple uh, in, into this larger context. And I also argue that typically the way that um, dominant society, and I would say dominant mainstream sort of academia views indigenous um, history as, or indigenous cultures as just local cultures, that are, that are provincial and sort of only tied to place and only can speak about certain issues. Um, but what I trace in this particular book project is sort of this longer tradition of indigenous peoples actually allying themselves with anti-colonial and anti-capitalist movements throughout the world um, in the 20th century. Um, and it's actually an attempt, I think, right now um, of indigenous historians to provincialize the United States the way in which it has uh, attempted to provincialize us. An indigenous, um, uh, to give you an example, Susan Miller calls it a global indigenous paradigm because indigenous peoples are very much a part of um, global um, processes such as imperialism and capitalism. Um, so really kind of pushing against the framework of how we understand that. Um, <clears throat> I want to turn to uh, water. So water too possesses a power and sovereignty that defy human-made borders and political territories. And so too does our connection to the river. The Missouri Basin is a massive circulatory system of streams, rivers, creeks, and tributaries that empties into the, its main artery, Minnesota, or the Missouri River. In this system, Minnesota begins everywhere the water falls from the, the sky to touch the earth and trickle into one of these waterways. The river is at about 2,400 miles long with a, a drainage basin, basin encompassing, excuse me, 529 square miles, which is about a landmass one-sixth the size of the continental U.S. So the Ocheti Shakoi is much uh, defined by Minnesota as it is by its, um, its own sort of political, cultural, and social relationship to its life-giving waters. In this world, water, water is life, and so too is the Buffalo Nation, or what we call the Pseo Yate. Hence the phrase Mini Wichoni, which means water is life, if you haven't figured that out. 
Um, vast buffalo herds once migrated according to the river's seasonal ebbs and flows and were followed by the hunting nations of the northern plains. And at the center of this world was uh, Hesapa, the Black Hills, the heart of everything that is. So if, if the Black Hills is the heart of the earth, then Minnesota is its, its aorta, to the Missouri River. And so it is from this country that the Ocheti Shakoi emerged as a nation, as a people, and gained its humanity. It was also here that um, Te Chinchala Skawi, the white buffalo calf woman, established the basis not only for human customary and ceremonial laws, but how Lakotas would exist in correct relation to the buffalo nation and non-human world. This first compact or treaty with the non-human world is recorded in Sichangu um, historian Brownhead's Winter Count. Um, and this is, this is a, I don't know if you can really see it, the, um, the uh, lighting is really bad, but this is actually the first um, recorded sort of history um, on, on a brown test winter count. It's the first pictograph. Uh, well, it's not the first. It's actually like the, uh, I think it's like the seventh. But he has, this is, this is a very significant one, um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. <laughs> um, his earliest... This earliest uh, pictograph depicts the white buffalo calf woman as a white buffalo arriving in the center of a camp circle in the first decade of the 10th century. Above the white buffalo is the, is the calf pipe, a yucca plant, and a corn stalk. To the right in English, brown hat, brown hat lists the various na animal nations the white buffalo calf woman brought into formal relations with the Ocheti Shakoi. And those include the elk, the deer, antelope, buffalo, beaver, and wolves. Um, and according to this history, it was a woman who formalized the first compact, the first treaty, with the Buffalo Nations and their human relatives. To be a good relative is to honor that, uh, that original instruction. So Lakotas often view treaties with the U.S. and other nations as commitments, not just to human relations, but also to non-human relations. And such agreements were not the sole domain of men, as was the tradition in white society. Most important, pite means female buffalo, and Pteoyate was alternatively known as her nation. The 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty established a 32 million acre permanent reservation, while in, which encompassed the entirety of uh, present day West River, South Dakota. To appease those who refused agency life, a vast expanse of hunting ground was set aside at nearly the same acreage of the permanent reservation, making the total territory about 70 million acres, or about the size of present day. Nevada. Article 11 of the treaty, however, stipulated the Lakota surrendered, quote, all right to occupy permanently the territory outside the reservation as Heron defined, uh, but retained the right to hunt in the, in the Powder River country so long as many, so long as the buffalo may range thereon in numbers that, to justify the chase. General uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, a member of the 1868 Peace Commission, at first opposed this provision, fearing that sustained resistance to buffalo hunting over a vast region would make it impossible to rein in the militant divisions. Fellow peace commissioners, however, assured him the treaty's clause was merely temporary because that once the buffalo were vanquished, so too would the million acres of hunting territory. In 1903, Red Cloud recalled what Lakota said to treaty commis commissioners regarding the hunting lands. Quote, we told them the, the country of the buffalo was the country of the Lakotas. We told them that the buffalo must have their country and the Lakotas must have their buffalo, end quote. But the Lakotas didn't believe the U.S. The US had the authority simpl to simply give them back land that already rightfully belonged to them and their buffalo kin. Red Cloud made, made clear in that, 1868 treaty, or that the 1868 treaty was not just an agreement between to human nation, but was also an agreement among the non-human ones as well. That Lakota territory began and ended with the Buffalo Nation's territory was his interpretation. Um, this understanding was not mystical reading, uh, was not a mystical reading, but a simple fact of Lakota life, and at this time a fact linked to pure survival. When Red Cloud spoke of the Buffalo Nations, he spoke of their true leaders, the women and not the bulls and the original covenant with the white buffalo calf woman. Therefore, the future of the Ocheti Shakoni was bound to the future of the Pateo Yate, or the Buffalo Nation, and vice versa. For its part, the military took seriously this vital connection with the buffalo as sustaining indigenous, continued indigenous resistance. The frontier armies 
were as much about securing armed defeat as, as they were about also exterminating, exterminating our kin, um, the Buffalo Nations. But, by, but punishing highly mobile uh, Plains Nations by defeating them in conventional battles was near impossible. From 1865 to 1883, the Frontier Army sanctioned the mass slaughter of buffalo to shatter the will to resist by eliminating a primary food supply and a close relative. The extermination of the buffalo was incredibly effective and efficient. In two decades, soldiers and hunters eradicated the remaining 10 to 15 million buffalo, living on several hundred, um, leaving only several hundred survivors. Taking only the hides and leaving the rest of the animal to rot, the rancid smell of decaying carcasses wafted over the plains. Hunters often poisoned their kill. The strychnine-laced carcasses killed off scavengers such as bears, wolves, or coyotes, and sometimes native peoples, all obstacles for white settlement. In this way, and also to, you know, there were actually buffalo out here, so um, that, that's kind of to give you an idea. So in, in total, there are about um, 25 to 30 million buffalo in, in North America. Um, and over the course of 150 years, there was two like mass extermination events. Um, one that happened um, uh, prior to or after the 1763 um, proclamation and the counter revolution of 1776, um, and the the expansion of white se settlement past the uh, the Allegheny Mountains. Um, and then a century later, in um, uh, after the Civil War, to quote unquote settle the West. Um, so in, in sort of these two intense, uh, these two intense sort of um, westward expansion moments, we often think of this as West, uh, settler colonialism as only being like a solely anthropocentric thing, or we think of like climate change or like environmental destruction as, as a recent phenomenon, but it's been an ongoing part of uh, the colonial process. So in this way, we can understand settler colonialism as more than just the elimination of native uh, of the native. Settler colonialism is a specific form of colonialism whereby an imperial power seizes native territory, eliminates the original people by force, removal, and political liquidation, and resettles the land with a foreign invading population. Unlike the European Holocaust, which had a beginning and an end and targeted humans alone, indigenous elimination as a practice and formal policy has not ended and also entails the wholesale destruction of non-human relations. So this also extends, as I argue, to the destruction of rivers. On April 1st, 2016, the Dakota Access Pipeline began, <coughs> or construction began. Um, Sacred Stone erected the first camp. In the summer of 2016, th tens of thousands answered the call and set up camp at the confluence of the Cannonball and Missouri Rivers on Ocheti Shakoni Treaty lands, now claimed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is also a branch of the military. Founded by Hongtawa and Hunkpapa, Standing Rock historian LaDonna Bravebold Allard, Sacred Stone took its name Ian Wakanga P.O.T. from the Lakota name for the Cannonball area. The names Cannonball and Sacred Stone describe the spherical stones that were once carved by whirlpools at the confluence of the two rivers. In the 1950s and 1960s, the Corps constructed a series of massive earthen rolled dams on the main stem of the Missouri River flooding native lands and forcefully relocating more than a thousand native families. Rebel Allard reflects on the history of the water. The Cannonball River's true name is Iyanwakanga Piwakwa, river that makes the sacred stones. And we have named the site of our resistance on, our fam on my family's land the Sacred Stone Camp. The stones are not created anymore ever since the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers dredged the mouth of the Cannonball River and flooded the area in the late 1950s as they finished the Oahe Dam. They killed a portion of our sacred river. I was a young girl when the floods came and des desecrated our burial sites and Sundance grounds. Our people are in that water. This river holds the story of my entire life. So the history of sacred stone evokes the essence of the struggle. It was here that water shaped earth and how the earth and water were used by state institutions to shape history. Land and water are not only about narrating the past of what was or what continues to be. Land and water are also about what should be a viable future. When land and water are taken and des or destroyed, the past is lost with them, and so too is the possibility of a livable future. Put another way, to enact violence against the land um, and water is also to enact violence against those who depend on it for life. Um, and this is sort of a, a really bad map. I don't have very good maps, and I apologize. Um, of the construction of 
the dams. And you can't really see it in here, but um, if you notice going down to this one, Gavin's Point, Fort Randall, Big Bend, Oahe, and then Garrison, and I'm going to go back some. But those were all constructed on Indian reservations. Um, and so in this case, in this case, um, we think of settler colonialism as one in which indigenous land is um, desired and valued so that it can be, you know, turned into farmland. It could be, you know, you can extract minerals from it, et cetera, et cetera. In this context, um, our land was desired not because of its inherent value, but um, um, to produce profit, but it was valued so that it could be wasted to put water on top of it. Um, and as a result, I mean, the, the dams themselves were built, uh, had kind of, they served multiple purposes. Um, Post-war employment, flood control, hydroelectricity, these are all the justifications by the state. And most importantly, irrigation for settler agriculture. In total, half a million acres of land were flooded, more than half of which was native land. 30% of uh, affected reservation populations were removed and displaced, including my family. 90% um, of commercial timbers were destroyed, and nearly 75% of all um, reservation wildlife was destroyed. And the reason why this is important, because at this time, um, you know, we, don't, we weren't dependent on the cash economy, and we largely subsisted off of the land, um, whether it's through uh, subsistence, agri subsistence small-scale agriculture, or whether it's through um, small sort of cattle ranching enterprises, or hunting and fishing. And all of that was taken away from us. And so after the dams were built, you had a skyrocket in um, uh, the sort of an epidemic of, of diabetes because to replace the, the quote unquote wild, you know, free goods of nature as they called them in these reports, um, they introduced the ration system of commodity foods, which were USDA of all things, USDA um, foods, um, which were high in sugar, um, flour, and fat. And so you saw uh, like an increase in, di in, in diabetes in these communities. Um, but also, one of the things that sustained us through each of these sort of moments of, of expansion and accumulation was the ability to resist um, in in encroachment by reproducing ourselves on the land, whether it was through the buffalo or whether it was through um, living in this, these fertile sort of bottomland areas along the river. And, it, you know, the Army Corps knew that. And... Um, the, uh, the military knew that. Um, and also uh, during this time, you had the advent of termination and relocation policies, which um, targeted uh, reservations um, for political liquidation and to you know, seek out to like, privatize their land. And so this, this policy of um, dam building actually coincided, coincided with termination and relocation. But also um, the Department of Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, worked with the Army Corps of Engineers to facilitate a termination and relocation policy. So they, they felt like these dams were a great opportunity to essentially get out of the Indian business. And how do you do that? Um, well, they're already being removed from the land, right? So that uh, implements relocation. And it also um, put a huge strain on our tribal councils to deal with this. And so then they started pushing in state jurisdiction um, laws. So those things worked in tandem. In, in that way. <clears throat> so we can often think of, um, I think, uh, no DAPL could be called an indigenous sovereignty movement, um, but indigenous sovereignty is typically understood as the so-called nation-to-nation relationship with the occupying power of the U.S. The state-centric framework of indigenous sovereignty has colonized um, the whole space of indigenous liberation. It has limited the field of maneuver and thinking within the colonial Westphalian state model, which I talked about earlier. Um, if the western frontier of U.S. expansion closed in 1890, as Frederick Jackson Turner prescribed, the 19th century Indian wars fought and won, Indian citizenship imposed in 1924, a formal apology issued in 2010. Did you know that? Who knew that the U.S. has formally apologized to indigenous nations? <laughs> The era of tribal self-determination inaugurated in 1970. The settlement of past wrongs under the recent Cobell lawsuit and the increase of nation-to-nation -nation rhetoric and policies under Obama and the key placement of indigenous leaders within his administration. Why do we need to create a new movement? 
More importantly, why would we need to create a new movement if indigenous life improved in the Obama era? And we can look to the important work of a movement marching under the banner of Black Lives Matter and why it, arose, why it also arose under the Obama administration. Obviously, anti-black police violence did not profoundly increase under Obama's presidency, nor did it dramatically decrease. The, movements, the movement gestured toward the limits of racial inclusion. The 2015 Baltimore police murder of Freddie Gray best illustrates the movement's primary contention and challenge. Freddie Gray was murdered by black police officers. A black district attorney, a black mayor, and a black president could not save black lives. So to paraphrase uh, Kianga Yamada Taylor, the current political system, no matter who's in charge, simply cannot save black lives. And the same could be said of indigenous peoples and the planet. Obama's 2010 New Energy Security Plan incentivized and dramatically increased domestic oil and gas production, opening up previously um, protected federal lands managed under the Department of Interior, the departmental home of the, of, of the Bureau of Indian Affairs for oil and gas exploration and hydraulic frac fracturing, also known as fracking. And I say this because there's this weird tendency, and I wrote this before, I wrote this before Trump became president. And it was a way to sort of implicate the Obama administration. But also I find it really weird now that Trump is president and he has placed Brian Zinke, you know, as Secretary of Interior, and people are like, oh my God, you know, they're, they're privatizing all of this land. And it's like, do you not know that that's the reason why the Department of Interior, Department of Interior was created in the first place? And that it facilitated the privatization of tens of millions of acres of indigenous lands at its founding at the turn of the century. And so, so to say that the Department of Interior is somehow, was somehow a benevolent institution under the Obama administration is entirely ahistorical and actually, you know, it's frankly insulting because what Ryan Zinke is doing is he's actually doing, it, the Department of Interior is working perfectly because that's what the Department of Interior was actually created to do. And I think we need to take that into consideration. Because while Alaska Native, Arctic Native communities faced displacement during, due to rising sea levels and the softening of permafrost caused by warming temperatures, Obama expanded Arctic offshore drilling and oil and gas exploration that was only possible because of permanently retreating polar ice caps. But the plan was reversed only after, only after it proved unprofitable and has since been put back on the table. Since 2008, however, domestic oil production has increased by 70%. This rapid increase of oil pipelines has kept apace domestic oil production, often imperiling indigenous and other frontline communities. Since 2010, the equivalent of 10 Keystone XL pipelines um, have been built. Although Obama denied the permit for phase four of KXL, which would have trespassed through um, Ocheti Shakoyan Treaty territory, he approved the first three phases of the pipeline in accordance with his domestic energy policy. The crude oil for DAPL is packed in the oil rich Bakken region in western South Dakota, and since 2008, Bakken oil production has sharply increased. Um, and this was primarily under the Obama administration, peaking in 2012, and since, um, since at this point it's kind of um, plateaued off. But the domestic energy boom received tremendous support under the Obama administration and was, was, and was part of the overall national economic recovery plan. And many viewed Obama's opposition to phase four of KXL as a recommitment to uphold indigenous sovereignty. Yet his administration's decision to deny its permit had less to do with indigenous sovereignty than it did with the fact that this leg of KXL transported Canadian-produced oil. Therefore, it fell outside of domestic energy production. DAPL, however, would transport domestically produced oil. And despite massive opposition, Obama refused to oppose its construction. DAPL is part of a massive carbon energy infrastructure built to drill the U.S. out of the Great Recession with or without indigenous consent. And so while the U.S. bailed out the banks and created the policy necessary to fast track oil production, it, fr it flatly ignored indigenous concerns and the quality of indigenous life hardly improved. Obama's grandiose nation to nation rhetoric and the placement of key, nati uh, key native leaders in his administration and regular consultation with indigenous nations over policy decisions simply could not halt DAPL and it could not save the water. It was simply too much of a departure um, from business as usual because the sacrifice of indigenous lands, waters, and lives has always been the salvation for the soul of a settler nation.
The Trump administration has aggressively accelerated Obama-era energy policies, fast-tracking the approval of the Dakota Access Pipeline and the Keystone XL within two weeks of taking office and within weeks of the forced eviction of the no DAPL camps. Um, let me skip over this section. Um, and, and the way that I, I, I want to kind of conclude is to think about um, in, this, in this current era of catastrophic climate change, oftentimes we look to the recent, and I think like, I think of the books that are coming out about climate change, and we often look to the recent sort of past, and I think we actually need to look, need to look deeper into the, in, in, in history. And the reason why I named my book um, Our History is the Future is because oftentimes indigenous peoples are placed safely in the past. And like indigenous politics and everything else is placed safely in the past. You know, tragic, lamentable, bygone era, but nonetheless in the past. And what we saw at Standing Rock was the articulation of a, a future sort of oriented project um, of indigenous liberation, but also um, at the same time when we were talking about the upholding of treaty rights, it wasn't one that was an exclusive project, but actually entailed or included uh, many sort of facets of, of non-indigenous life as well. So, so <clears throat> Mini Richoni, as much as it relates, uh, or as much as it reaches into the past, is a future-oriented project. It forces some to confront their own unbelonging to the, to the land and, and the river. How does settler society, which possesses no fundamental ethical relationship to the land or its original people, begin to imagine a future premised on justice? There's no simple answer to that question. What we can begin to imagine, however, is indigenous futures, futures that were under construction at the No Dapple camps, where indigenous peoples do not merely survive, but thrive. No Dapple offered a brief vision of, of what a future premise on indigenous um, justice would look like. With all its faults, there's something to be learned from the treaty camps at the confluence of the Missouri and Cannonball Rivers. Free food, free education, free healthcare, free legal aid, a strong sense of community, community security, et cetera, while not perfect, were guaranteed to all. Most reservation communities in the U.S. don't have access to these services, and most poor communities don't have access to these services. Yet in the absence of empire, with governing structures in the camps, people came together to help each other, to take care of each other. And so a, a form of radical relationality was the law. So how can... <clears throat> How can we begin to imagine a just and peaceful future if the structures that destroy our lands continue to carry out the will of that militarized and white supremacist empire? Settler society has a failed kinship with, with many so and perhaps water the planet and non the non-human world in general. Settler colonialism must be undone if there is to be a livable future, not just in Turtle Island, but for the entire world. And whereas past revolutionary struggles have sought to emancipate labor from the rule of capital, in our current moment of catastrophic and irreversible climate change, we must begin to ask not what capital um, and settler states want from us. We already know what they want. They want inclusion in the sustainability of the status quo. And water protectors ask us to consider, what does water want from us? In this sense, mini Wichoni, water is life, exists outside the logic of capital. And the radical demand is not merely to emancipate labor from capital, but to emanci emancipate the earth and all our relations from capital. So that's it. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Is, does anybody have a question? I guess my question is two part. So um, I don't, so there are many different countries around the world trying to address or reconcile with the past Canada as one that just passed a few, some federal laws that will, you know, try and reconcile with their First Nations people. Mexico's trying to do something, Australia's trying to do, and even some African nations. Are there some um, countries that you feel are doing some great work in this or trying to reconcile with the past and work with First Nations people? Aboriginal people, depending on the country that you're in. Mm -hmm. And then my se the second part to the question is, what role do you think higher ed institutions play in this mm -hmm. kind of mm 
um, context because you see some <clears throat> institutions in um, other countries, namely the Global South, that are trying to um, teach their students and to highlight the importance of them bringing in their, their native language or defending their thesis in their native language as ways to address what society can't. So what role do you see higher institutions playing in reconciling with the past and the future? Those are really great questions. Um, to answer the first one, um, I'll do it a little bit briefly because um, it's a really complicated issue. Like for the, the truth and reconciliation process in Canada um, has brought about uh, sweeping reforms um, institutionally, has brought about a lot of kind of money to be placed within um, their state institutions for um, addressing these past wrongs. But the word reconciliation is really problematic because it actually assumes that there's conciliation to begin with. Um, so how do you reconcile with a nation that has never, that either you never had good relationships with in the first place? And so I think we need to actually premise our, our conversation on justice and not on reconciliation because it assumes that there are like, that we're like this idea of like nation to nation, it assumes that we're equals and we're not. Like we are not a white supremacist military, militarized empire that's invading other countries. Um, we are not equals in that, in that context. Um, so I think the language of reconciliation is problematic from the get-go, but it doesn't mean that um, we should sort of abandon sort of these projects and these investigations because what was revealed in the Canadian context was um, rampant generational sort of abuse, um, primarily with the residential school system. And now they have, they have the truth and they can like, that's their, their level of basis is that they operate from the level of acknowledgement that they are a colonial society. And that is, that is huge because it's in such denial. I mean, just look around this campus. What, what acknowledgement that this, you know, that this campus was founded by invaders, you know, that this is stolen indigenous land. There's no acknowledgement. Um, so I think that there are, there are sort of, um, I think those are like steps in the right direction and there's a lot, and I, I follow the truth and reconciliation process really closely, but to just kind of give you an example of um, sort of the limitations of that process, um, at the height of this, you know, we're coming out of the end, there's been all of this testimony and people are kind of reflecting on these thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of testimony that have come out and you have Colton Bushi who was a, a, a First Nation 22-year-old, um, a young person, who was murdered by a white man on his property in, in Saskatchewan, and that white man was found not guilty um, in the last couple of weeks. And then <clears throat> almost like a week later, um, Tina Fontaine, who was a 15-year-old uh, First Nations um, girl, was, uh, her body was found in the Red River. Um, she was like brutalized and murdered, um, and her white killer, <laughs> was also found not guilty as well. And I think we can understand that within this truth, truth and reconciliation process, that those were verdicts for Canada's own, um, own sort of, it, it gave itself a not guilty um, a verdict as well. Um, and it just shows that, that despite this sort of visibility, that the system is still operating full steam ahead and eliminating um, all the most vulnerable of society, which is indigenous youth and primarily indigenous women and girls. Um, I would also say that um, as part of that process, I think um, we can look at Trudeau. You know, he's like, Trudeau's like this uh, neoliberal, multicultural wonder boy who's like running around the world, like dressing in saris and like, you know, crying and hugging people. Um, and part of this, like the, the kind of figurehead of this, and he, like, I, I, I think in the U.S., U.S. politics, and you know, unfortunately, because of American exceptionalism, we're so or parochial, and we don't see anything else. And it's embarrassing, honestly, because <laughs> um, the rest of the world views us in very negative ways. But we need to be following what's going on in Canada, because Canada is like here. You have a liberal government, right? Who's like hugging, you know, crying with native people, um, going around the world dressing in you know feathers and headdresses, um, but yet he's still building pipelines through indigenous lands, right? And there's still this, this massive um, outcry against murdered and missing indigenous women, and that has never subsided, right? So it's, there, it's too much of a radical departure from the status quo, and it just shows that even under liberal regimes, even under so-called, you know, I, I use this very loosely because I wouldn't consider them left, um, but like left governments, right, that this, these things um, still happen, um, even under the Obama administration as well.
Um, so I think we need to really disabuse ourselves of this notion that um, liberals or conservatives have a better sort of more just agenda because they're still operating within a colonial state structure. And that gets to the last question, the second part of your question, um, is that I do think that universities um, participate in, uh, in indigenous erasure and um, just denial in general um, about history. It's, I'm really shocked at the, the kinds of history that's being taught at um, institution, institutions of higher education in the Northeast. You need more people like Jamie um, <laughs> in, these, in these institutions. You need more, you can't just hire one faculty. You can't just hire one person and expect them to change an institution. It has to be a structural, like it has to be an institutional commitment. Um, and there are sort of models out there um, of partnerships. And I say partnerships with the nations that live here. Like what do they want? What are their research agendas? Do you even know the nations that live here? Have you met? You know, have you have um, are like are they okay with what's um, going on on this campus? And it was interesting because last week at um, a presentation that I did that was um, hosted by Jamie and um, um, Yataka Fields, um, that was the first time I've ever seen a Massachusetts person do a a land acknowledgement. And I've lived here for almost nine months now, so. That was that was really shocking to me because that wouldn't happen where I'm where I'm from. You know, um, there's just more acknowledgement and actual just truth. So I think it's incumbent upon universities not to just have like, oh, today we're going to do indigenous studies, you know, and then tomorrow we're going to do black studies, but to understand these things as as related, but also that there's there's an a, a, um, um, committed resources to doing these um, and facilitating sort of a broader sort of systemic change and not just like piecemeal or band-aid change. And it's funny because like these universities have been around like they're the oldest universities in the country and they're like so far behind. <laughs> Anyways. So it's really complicated because the environmental movement narrates its own history um, as kind of like part of these like white environmentalists who imagine themselves on the frontier in wide open spaces. So like I don't, I've, I reluctantly not called myself, I mean not reluctantly, I just, I don't call myself an environmentalist because I don't believe in that tradition at all. Um, I think it's because it's invested in white supremacy and empire building. Um, and so the environmental movement actually needs to acknowledge that and stop pretending that it's like it's not it's not kind of descendant from that genealogy. Because I go to these I go to these conferences or I see presentations and people are like, yeah, I know it's just like you know the beards that I'm going to talk about, um, and I recognize that it's only white men, but I'm just going to talk about it because that's the only thing I know. Um, and so I think there isn't there's a reluctance still. Um, Understanding that historically, um, like John Muir, Leo, um, the other guy Leopold, I can't remember. His, I can't. Remember, I never remember them because I've kind of disabused myself of like thinking of them as like as the beards. You know, I call them the beards, <laughs> but um, as as like the founders because um, at that time there was active like colonial dispossession going on and they were helping participate in that. And so I don't see them as part of my tradition at all. Um, and so I don't consider that part of the environmental tradition. So I think environmentalists need to look look at, they need to have that come to God moment and be like, am I really, like for example, to give you an example, right now in the San Juan Basin, um, there's the, the Bureau of Land Management is um, auctioning off online the final remaining um, lands uh, for um, fracking, um, which are part of the greater Chaco landscape. Chaco Canyon is a world heritage site. Everyone knows that. but all of these environmental groups such as Sierra Club, 350, they want to come in and they want to be like, you know, we're against fracking because it's going to, you know, destroy the landscape. And it completely erases the fact that they're indigenous peoples that live on that land. And nobody, I mean, they want to protect the land, but they don't care at all about the native people that live there and that are the actual caretakers of that land. And it's just a recurring trope in, in, in the environmental movement where it's like, we can't, like Patagonia um, says, protect our lands, right? after the Bears Ears um, uh, monument was reduced. And it's like, it's like, um, what do you mean our land, Pilgrim? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so um, I think that there's, I don't know, I don't know how, I mean, it's, I used to teach environment, science, and technology, and we'd have to teach those, those 
the beards and like and it's so ingrained within the culture of an environmentalism that there is this um, kind of very visible whiteness to it and very visible masculinity to it and it, it needs you know it's it's it needs it needs to have a come to God moment and I don't know how to do that but at the same time I will say that at Standing Rock there were you know very committed environmentalists who were there who were taking you know who were following le indigenous leadership and that it does show that there is a possibility and the thing is is that you kind of operate on these varying degrees of spectrums and one of them is like white people think that they need to become indigenous to like understand indigenous causes and it's like Solidarity is one of the most beautiful things in the world because it's cheap and it's free, right? And you don't need to be an indigenous person to understand that you need clean drinking water and that this is going to destroy the land, landscape. I don't need to be an indigenous person to understand that, right? And I think people need to um, um, re, like, reconsider what forms of um, solidarity, like what solidarity does and what it looks like. Um, and that to understand that it is cheap and free. It doesn't cost anything for somebody. Um, but why is it so hard to um, why is it so hard to um, get out there and support these things, or to not center whiteness, or to not center um, uh, heteropatriarchy? You know. Hi, I'm Julie with Our Spaces, and my question has to do with land ownership, because it's been my impression that for Native peoples, the, the, the earth wasn't something that you could own. Mm -hmm. And so some of the confusion over time is that with the treaties and other things is that they would make a peace treaty, but it had nothing to do with granting ownership. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what, what you just said about pilgrims and, you know, yours and well who's really and you know it's it's there's a question there about ownership mm -hmm. so so maybe uh for native peoples there never was a feeling that you had to own you had certain places where you hunting was respected that so and you know certain tribes would be hunting in certain areas but um maybe it's the western way of ownership that has driven the native peoples to then adopt the need for ownership because people weren't taking care of the land properly. Mm -hmm. Get the idea? Yeah. I mean, private property is based on exclusion, and private property is inherently racialized because private property means the ownership of not just land, but in this country, it's also meant the ownership of bodies of people, human beings. Um, and so, I th uh, Cheryl Harris has this really great phrase it's like, whiteness is property. I think it's really funny because we think about that kind of like in an abstract sense of like, oh, you know, like there's this, you know, that happened in, during slavery. But if, if you actually look and quantify private land ownership in the United States, it's 96% white. And if you, you know, think about the Second Amendment, for example, which was created um, to essentially prevent indigenous resistance, or to crush indigenous resistance and prevent slave revolts and to protect private land, right, stand your ground it descends from this notion of, of, of private property ownership that like 60% of gun owners are, are white, you know, and 30% of gun owners are white men um, specifically. So thinking about that in the context of like how that translates into ownership um, is really, is really, um, it really kind of uh, uh, talks about this idea how this land was taken and how private property works and exists. But I also don't think that like there's a, this idea that like, that we can return to this like commons, you know, like I think a lot of environmentalists be like, oh, well, these are all our natural resources or all our, it forgets that these are like, for example, Bears Ears is a sacred site to five indigenous nations that, that they had relationships to that particular site um, prior to the formation of, of the U.S. Um, and still continue to have that relationship. You can ask another question. It has to do with the future that you're going yeah. to project, because right, right now, for um, all of us, 30% of the Earth is um, is within nation states, right, and all of the ownership that goes along with it. But 70% of the Earth 
does not have any ownership. It's mm -hmm. international spaces. So we're going to have to figure out how we, as a whole, as the Earth, how we work with the 70%. And maybe there's something in your book or in your thoughts about how, I mean, you just mentioned common heritage and common interests, how we come together to deal better mm -hmm. on a global world view. Well, I mean, the problem with that is that the way that the law is structured is, is it, it's, it's, I say settler colonialism not as something that happened in the past, but it's an ongoing thing. It's like, for example, when we quantify water rights on the Missouri River, it's quantified towards private usage versus tribal usage. And it always works in the favor of private industry. Um, so it, it, the, the definition of settler isn't something that I just like made up, but it's actually codified in the law. So under our current system, it doesn't matter if we want to you know, live in this, you know, oh, I'm going to go and shake all my, you know, my neighbor's hands and we're going to live in peace and harmony. The way that water usage and land usage is quantified is quantified according to race. And not just race, but the creation of this, of this legal subject called a settler. And I'm not, I'm not like making this up. It's like it's ingrained in the law. So like when we talk about w indigenous water rights, our water rights are always quantified about how much we don't use. And it actually is like a quantification of our sovereignty. It's like, for example, the Navajo Nation has the Little Colorado River running through it, and it has less than a half a percentage ownership, quote unquote, according to usage of the very river that's flowing through its, its, its national borders. The rest of that gets siphoned off and gets weighed, against, um, gets weighed against tribal usage and gets siphoned off to places like Phoenix and Los Angeles. So the water coming out of your tap is like literally, it's a quantification of, of sovereignty. And people don't, I mean, it's, um, it's hard to imagine a, a just future in this current system that's based, that's premised on the, the expropriation, the continued expropriation of indigenous resources and lands. And so the only way, like what I'm talking about is absent of that, absent of these, these colonial institutions, what do people do? They don't build jails. They don't build, you know, um, forms of private property or like even commerce, but they, they identify needs of communities, which is education, health care, free food, you know, um, access to legal aid. Um, and so when we, when I say like our history is the future, because this is premised on our value system, right? And that it has to operate entirely surrounded by a 24-7 military occupation. And that should be concerning to us because if, What's what's you know what's what's threatened here? What's threatened? Um, uh, you know why did why were 96 um, law enforcement jurisdiction called out to crush this particular um, this particular protest movement? And that's what I'm talking about. I'm not like I don't think that I, I really don't think in this current system that indigenous nations um, interests will be served um, because it, it requires the continued pillaging of our lands. And that's just the way it is. Like the way that the where where this pipeline was constructed was through unceded treaty territory and it has never been resolved by the court of law about who is the quote unquote correct owner of that land because people just squatted on it and eventually, you know, um, the state assumed jurisdiction over it, even though it was never formally ceded to the U.S. So we're going to have to leave it like that because I know some people have to run to class, but I invite you to come to South Africa first because we have more questions. Let's thank him one more time. <laughs>